This video will cover the physics behind the shape of mega voltage beam profiles and how they vary with depth and oblique beam incidence. This will all make a lot more sense if you watch video 8.1 on looking at photon dose distributions first. Beam profiles are measured in a scanning water phantom by moving a detector from side to side while the beam is on. Just like we discussed in the video on percentage depth dose curves, profiles are normally normalized. This means that we take one point on the profile, normally at the center, and divide the dose at every point in the profile by the dose at this normalization point, then multiply it by 100. This gives us a beam profile expressed as a percentage of the dose at the normalization point. So the dose on the central beam axis will be 100%, and the dose at this point, which is half that of the central axis, will be 50%. Points on a beam profile can also be expressed as an off-axis ratio, or OAR, which are often used in monitor unit calculations. Calculating an off-axis ratio is very similar to normalizing the profile to the point on the central axis, in that we divide the dose at each point by the dose at the normalization point, except this time we don't multiply it by 100. In a moment I'm going to be talking about things like beam flatness and symmetry, but before I describe what these things are, let's talk about why we should care about them. The goal of radiotherapy is normally to sterilize tumors. We want to stop every single cancerous cell in every single part of the tumor from dividing. This means that as a bare minimum, we need to give every single part of the tumor a dose that stands a reasonable chance of accomplishing this. Missing even one cell can increase the chances of the tumor growing back, so we need to ensure that a tumor is covered completely by a high prescribed dose. We also need to avoid as much as possible irradiating surrounding tissues in order to minimize side effects. If we look at an ideal, meaning completely unrealistic case, of a beam that delivers a completely uniform dose inside of the field, and no dose outside of the field, it's pretty easy to balance these two requirements. Since all you have to do is get the target inside the beam and it will get its full prescribed dose, and anything around the outside will get no dose. If we look at a more realistic case in which a beam delivers some dose outside of the field, if we want to deliver that same uniform high dose to the target, we need to accept that we're going to be delivering more dose to tissues outside of the target. This is why it's important to minimize the dose outside of the flat central region of the beam profile where possible so there's only the flat region that's capable of delivering a uniform, full dose to a target. If the center of the beam isn't flat, it doesn't change the fact that the entire target still needs to receive that minimum prescribed dose. If the profile is peaked in the middle like this, which we would see if the beam wasn't flattened, in order to give a sufficient dose to the edges of the target, we would have to accept a much higher dose in the center of the target. If this only occurred within the target, it might not be such a bad thing, but bear in mind that the entire beam will have a higher dose in the center. So if you have structures that you'd like to avoid above or below the target, these will be getting a higher dose in the center too. So we prefer to use flat beams where possible. A radiation field size is generally taken to be the distance between 50% dose points in a beam profile that's been measured at the LINAC ISO center, that is a center of rotation of the machine gantry, which is normally 100 centimeters from the source. Depending on how your center operates though, if you're telling your machine to deliver a 10 by 10 centimeter field, those dimensions are going to be determined by the size of the linear accelerant on light field. The light field is a beam of visible light that follows approximately the same path as a LINAC X-ray beam. This is a secondary point, but when we're commissioning a treatment planning system, we feed in a whole bunch of profiles and percentage depth dose curves that are measured at various field sizes that are based on the size of the light field. So when you use a treatment planning system to calculate the dose of, say, a 10 by 10 centimeter field, the distance between the 50% dose points might not be 10 centimeters, but it will be the same as for a field delivered when the light field says that the field is 10 by 10 centimeters. It may be slightly different, but a treatment planning system, even a manual one if it's commissioned properly, will encourage you to use the correct field sizes to meet the goals of your treatment anyway. It's also worth noting that the field size needs to be defined at a specific distance from the source, like 100 centimeters, because the beam is diverging and the field size will change with this distance. So what might be a 10 by 10 centimeter field at one depth will get bigger and bigger as you get further away from the source. Dose profiles of unflattened beams tend to have a big peak in the middle. That's why we need a flattening filter to produce a uniform beam. When a flattening filter is used, a beam normally has a flattish section in the middle, which we call the umbra, and regions either side in which the dose drops rapidly, which we call the beam penumbra. A megavoltage beam profile is never perfectly uniform, and the degree of uniformity tends to change with depth. That's partly because the beam is diverging, so the source-to-surface distance tends to vary with distance along the profile, being greatest at the edges and smallest right in the center. The depth of material the parts of the beam have to pass through to reach the depth at which we're measuring the profile is also variable too. Beam divergence means that portions of the beam near the edges have to travel through a greater thickness of material in order to reach the depth at which we're measuring the profile. This combined with a longer SSD, which reduces dose, can lead to profiles that have lower dose near the edges. This can be offset somewhat by the flattening filter, 
This works to offset both the fact that the Bremsstrahlung interaction produces more photons at the centre of the beam, and also due to the effects of increasing SSD and depth with distance from the centre of the beam. This doesn't just directly affect the beam flatness, it also affects the beam energy spectrum. Passing the centre of the beam through more material means that it experiences more filtration, and the centre of the beam tends to have a higher energy as a result. Beam flatness is a measure of how much dose varies within the umbra of a beam profile. This is usually defined as a part of the beam that exists between the 80% dose points on either side of the beam central axis. It's expressed as the difference between the maximum and minimum dose in this region, divided by the sum of these two same doses, and multiplied by 100 to convert it into a percentage. It's normally calculated based on a profile measured at 10 cm depth. As the name implies, symmetry is a measure of how symmetrical the beam is within the umbra. It can be used as a measure to evaluate how well the X-ray beam is aligned with the flattening filter, since the flattening filter relies on the most intense part of the beam passing through the thickest part of the filter. If the beam moves side to side or the angle changes, then the beam produced will be asymmetrical. Symmetry can be calculated in a number of ways. It can be determined by looking at each individual point in the profile and comparing it with a mirror image point on the other side of the beam central axis. So looking at points that are equal distance from the beam central axis and looking for the maximum distance between these two points. Or it can be obtained by comparing the area under the curve on the left side of the profile to the area under the curve on the right side of the profile. So dividing the difference between these areas by the sum of these two areas and multiplying the result by 100. Calculated flatness and symmetry are used to determine if a beam is correctly adjusted. The beam per number is generally defined as the distance between the 80% and 20% dose points on the same side of the profile. We want to keep this to a minimum, and size depends on a few different things. One of these is a source size, because a larger source produces a beam that's more difficult to clip sharply with a collimator. Photons produced on the side of the source that's further from the collimator are able to move at an angle that allows them to strike the patient further from the beam central axis, which blurs out the beam edge, thus widening the penumbra. The collimator edge is also important, as I mentioned in the video on multi-lead collimators. If the edges of the collimator weren't focused, that is if they moved horizontally through the beam, the beam would be able to take short paths through the jaw close to its lower edge. This would allow for a decent amount of this beam to make it through, and contribute small amounts of dose outside the main part of the beam, which would broaden the penumbra. The beam energy is also important, because remember that a photon beam turns every irradiated point in a phantom or a patient into a small source of electrons and scattered photons. As beam energy increases, secondary electron range increases also. Electrons produced by points near the edge of the beam are going to drift outside of the beam itself and contribute dose outside. This is a very significant reason of why beam numbers exist in the first place. As the beam energy increases, secondary electron range increases, and electrons travel further outside of the beam, which widens the beam penumbra. Treatment head scanner also increases the width of the penumbra. A lot of scatter occurs inside the flattening filter, which is closer to the patient than the target. This allows scattered photons to take steeply angled paths and contribute dose outside of the field. I mentioned before that a megavoltage beam profile will never be perfectly flat and symmetrical. When measuring a profile at the depth of maximum dose, you'll notice that there's a lower dose in the center of the beam than near the edges of the beam umbra. These small peaks in dose either side of the central axis are called dose horns. They occur because of the flattening filter. The higher filtration at the center of the beam that's used to level out the beam intensity also results in a higher energy than at the edges. So the edges of the beam, being of lower energy, tend to deposit their dose at shallower depths in the center of the beam. This is why the dose is higher here at shallow depths like the depth of maximum dose. The edges of the beam also have a larger source to surface distance. This results in a lower beam intensity, but this is offset by the effects of the flattening filter. It also reduces the rate of dose fall off with depth. But regions of the beam closer to the edge also travel a greater path length through tissue to reach the profile depth, which increases the fall off with depth. This combined with the lower energy of the beam in these regions results in a faster dose fall off at the edges with depth. If we look at a profile measured at 10 cm depth, we'll see that it's much flatter. That's because the parts of the beam that make up the dose horns have been attenuated at a much greater rate than the center of the beam. So the beam has leveled out. This generally occurs at about 10 cm depth because the flattening filter is designed to produce maximum flatness at this depth, which is where we might normally expect to find a target. The beam is also wider because this profile is measured at a greater depth and the beam is diverging. If we measure a profile at an even greater depth, we see that the dose in the center of the beam is actually higher. This is because the low energy portions of the beam have been attenuated at a greater rate, and the high energy portion at the center has been attenuated at a lower rate, so there are now more photons left in the center of the beam. And we see that once again the beam is wider. A photon beam striking a patient at an oblique angle will produce a different shaped beam profile for a number of reasons. The first of these is that the side of the beam that's closest to the source will travel less distance before it strikes the patient, so it has a shorter source to surface distance. This results in a higher beam intensity at the profile depth, and therefore a higher dose. The other side has a longer source to surface distance, and therefore has a lower dose. The distance traveled through the patient on both sides of the beam is also different. The side that's closest to the source will travel a shorter distance and therefore experience less attenuation, and the side that's further away will travel a longer distance and experience more attenuation, 
The net effect that we see is that the profile is tilted, and the profile extends a lot further away from the central axis on the side opposite to the source, because angling the beam moves the distant edge of the beam further away from the central axis. We also see that the profile is tilted at a greater angle than that of the beam incidence. That's because this tilt is due to the combined effect of different sorts of surface distances and different attenuation on different sides of the profile. When radiotherapy beam field sizes are very small, we see some very strange effects. The reason for this is very similar to the one I used to explain why beam penumbra is wider for larger beam energies. If we look at a photon beam turning each point in the beam into a tiny secondary electron source, remembering that dose at each point is proportional to the number of secondary electrons that pass through it, the beam umbra is made up of those points in the center of the beam that have enough radiation sources around them in order to get a full dose. The beam penumbra is made up of points that aren't getting full dose, because they're right next to areas that aren't being irradiated and therefore aren't producing secondary electrons. If the beam size is smaller than the lateral secondary electron range, then there are no regions of the beam where there is full overlap. Therefore, there's no real beam umbra to speak of. The whole beam is essentially penumbra, and the profile looks a little bit like a normal distribution, since there's no flat portion in the middle. The dose is also quite significantly reduced in the center of the profile, compared with if the beam was equal to or bigger than the lateral electron range.